I'll start by talking about uh, the early part of uh, the 20th century um, Igbo land and how decisions got made. Decision making in Igbo land was by consensus. It was consensus in that there was no king, there was no monarch. Uh, they simply didn't have these things. All the uh, modern traditional rulers, Igwe's, are just modern creations. And of course now we have every village and probably got into every household having traditional ruler. <laughs> <clears throat> but it was an effective system. And so effective that Whenever uh, there was a decision to be made, you will have a collection of uh, people, both those who are rich and those who are poor, and they will come together to uh, make decisions. And you will find the poorest of the poor being able to point to the richest of the rich about something that he said he didn't like. It was very effective. That's democracy. But if there's something to be decided on and uh, they couldn't come to that consensus, they would, find, they would go to um, the chief priest. The chief priest will come to make the decision. In my village, the chief priest was my grandfather at his time, and it was called the Atama. The Atama was, had to be a person of uh, honesty, transparency, and integrity. What I got, and my, uh, my uh, members of my family, descendants of this Atama, are just these values. We got these values, and I say that they have been very helpful to me. Integrity in particular, in fact, a book I want to write is Integrity as a Commodity. I believe that you can almost literally sell integrity, uh, quite contrary to what people think about uh, just uh, anything, any, any, anything goes in, uh, in Nigeria, uh, that you don't have to be a person of integrity to make it in life, and, uh, which is the root cause of corruption in Nigeria. In fact, I believe that the company that uh, I founded um, uh, before coming to serve in government. It's about, um, about this integrity, because as a professor, I didn't have a whole lot of money, but it was because people that knew me believed that I had the correct ideas and that they could invest in me that this company uh, got built, and I will come to that. So what I take away from that period was honesty, integrity, and uh, transparency. The other thing I want, a uh, short story I want to tell you is about the Biafra-Nigerian War period and learning to survive. During this period, you might have, uh, many of you may not be old enough to know about it, but maybe you have read about the Biafra-Nigerian uh, War and the Pashoko period, pot-bellied children, uh, who are dying uh, because they couldn't get enough nutrition. My family would, uh, were refugees like uh, all the others in Biafran side, we were on the Biafran side. And wherever we got, my uncle who was leader of the family would uh, uh, work with us to plant crops, fast growing crops and vegetables so that we would have some kind of uh, meal that would be balanced. So we didn't have to go to stand in line uh, to uh, uh, beg for food. And for me, I was about 11 at that time, and I would go to, uh, to the river and fish. Um, I would use a, a long stick with string attached and uh, hook at the end, 
with floater in the middle. And uh, within two hours, I would have caught some fish to supplement the family's diet. What I, I learned that time was that you can survive on your own. And uh, on a larger scale, it's about trade in Africa versus aid. That instead of giving Africans uh, aid continuously, that we could do something ourselves and become and get in the business of being uh, exchange of goods and services with other countries, aid versus trade. That was something that I got from, from that. Now also, uh, in the early days of uh, Western education in Igbo land, communities would literally join together to send one child to school. They could send a child to secondary school, if the child is bright enough, to university, to England, which was the place where people came to at that time, where you are. And uh, they would celebrate upon the return of this child as a community. What we find now is that this is all not possible. People have become extremely selfish, they're no longer able to band together to send anybody to, to, to school. In my family, what we did was my, uh, the uncles and the aunts would send, uh, do kind of the same thing, except send uh, children, doesn't have to be their child, to school. And my father sent my uncle to school. My uncle took care of many of us. You don't have to be, you don't discriminate. It has to be your child. More recently, I kind of modernized it, set up a foundation, and uh, we, based on that, we have been able to produce about uh, almost 400 graduates, wow. considering that when I went to America the first time, we only had three graduates in our town. So uh, I say it's because it is the community effort actually does work. It's something that we are uh, we are losing. Um, if we are less selfish and more giving to the community and country, we would be able to uh, do better. The um, other thing I want to talk about is solving complex problems. Um, I learned when I became a professor in America that I just wasn't going to go, uh, uh, go fast unless I undertook serious problems and found ways to solve them, solve this serious problem. But that problem cannot be solved, I quickly realized, by myself alone. It required a team of highly talented people to work with me. So whatever I achieved as a professor came from the work of team, very talented people working together to achieve a common purpose. Usually we undertake projects that will be, you know, the result could come in five years or 10 years time. But in the end, uh, it would be something that will add real value to, uh, to the uh, country or the, the world out there. The, but it is the sort of situation that we, we found uh, in, um, in the power sector. Uh, I know that, I, I know that uh, 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 um, uh, my brother Pat Utomi and uh, Father Kuka talked about confusion. Um, I will tell you that the power sector in Nigeria is the headquarters of confusion. <laughs> uh, absolutely. It's a place where, if you're talking about rent seeking, this is where it is at. This is where corruption headquarters is at. There's a study done, and um, that study showed that the PHCN, which is the power holding company of Nigeria, 
which is the uh, government institution providing power, was the most corrupt institution by far, followed by the police force. So you can imagine if the <laughs> any institution that is, that is worse uh, than the police had to be quite an institution. <laughs> and the PACN is that institution. Unfortunately for me, this is the institution that I have been uh, asked for reform by the president of Nigeria. But before I talk about it, let me talk about the Abai PP, which in my introduction, Dr. Aya talked about. The Abai Independent Power Project uh, is one of these things that uh, when, if you really believe in something and go at it and, be, and persist, you achieve. When I was starting the Aba uh, Independent Power Project, I just came out from the United, came back from the United States. In fact, I didn't come back. I was in the United States as a professor of engineering, and I started the uh, the power company. And um, uh, we first built a small power plant in uh, in Abuja, and then uh, went on to uh, uh, to use the model of supplying reliable electricity to a small area to expand to ABBA. So we went and built, uh, began to do the ABBA IPP. When I was starting, and ABBA project was going to cost a lot of money. Uh, some, of, some people in America, who were Nigerians, said, there's no way anybody will give this professor money. He's a professor, he he's does well as a professor, but giving him money to build power plant in Nigeria, not possible. One guy said he would bet his life on it that I would not get any money. <laughs> uh, worst of all, the, 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 we were talking about major institutions uh, giving us uh, uh, funds. In the end, through persistence, we were able to get enough money. We have in ABA invested about $400 million, and we were able to get the money to invest and do this, but it came by going through roadblock after roadblock and just being persistent and persevering. So it's actually that project that led the president to say, well, uh, maybe we should just ask him to come and work on, uh, on the reform. I tried to uh, resist uh, because I was quite comfortable in doing my private power, uh, but, and I knew that uh, the Nigerian power sector was not a good terrain to be in. But here I am. Uh, I have a lot of challenges. But I remember solving complex problems, you need highly talented people with good strategy and you'll be able to do it. That's what I, I have done. Put together a lot of very good minds, uh, in the task force, and they are working. And we've been able to do stuff. I don't know if you've been uh, able to see, some of you might have seen the power roadmap that we developed. The power roadmap isn't so much uh, a, a, a new plan. It's actually the implementation of an act made by parliament on reforming the power sector, except people are opposed to reforming the power sector. They prefer for Nigeria to stay very much where it is, why? Because as uh, Father Kuka talked about, there are people benefiting from status quo. Generator suppliers, <coughs> diesel suppliers, diesel truckers, people awarding contracts in government, people receiving the contracts, people in government who benefit from contracting, contractocracy, we call it. So all these people are totally opposed to any form of reform of the power sector. So those are the people we are, we are dealing with. So my, my problem is quite complicated because now the, 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 their face is the union. Uh, so they use the union, they support the union financially to fight reform. And the union people say that we are selling their patrimony 
were out there trying to sell their, pat uh, their patrimony to foreigners and uh, friends. Uh, their patrimony is, happens to be 2,400 megawatts, uh, a generating, uh, power generating um, uh, stations. For a country of 150 million, when South Africa generates over 40,000 megawatts, their own power station generates 2,400 megawatts, and the independent power that just began to, uh, to operate are generating uh, the uh, supplement to 3,500 megawatts. We're expecting that Nigeria should open up the sector. That's what the reform is about. Be able to allow, according to the, what the president wants to do, have uh, generate all the generating companies privatized, distribution companies privatized, except for in generating companies, the hydropower plants will be concessioned. The outcome is that it becomes possible to have bilateral agreements between distribution companies and generation companies so that people will be free, just like in the GSM, in the um, uh, telephony situation. People will be able to build power plants and sell power. The place will be free. Government doesn't have to invest money anymore. This is what we're trying to do. So it is, uh, but the people who are benefiting don't want any of this because the distribution companies want to continue to make, uh, to sell transformers or give transformers away uh, without you knowing what's, what's going on. So there is a, a lot that um, uh, is required to reform the, uh, the sector. I'd like to say that Nigeria, in fact, Africa, must return to the value uh, system of the past for what they offer us. Those value systems of honesty, integrity, resilience, and transparency. And we must refuse to say uh, that we can't do it. And Nigeria, in particular, has to accept that although the problems are quite complex, that high-quality minds working together with clear strategy can deliver the results. These are the things that we want to achieve in Nigeria power reform. Thank you.